Thank you very much. Can, can you all hear me? Am I, am I? No? How about now? I think it, the gain just needs to be turned up a little bit. All right, good. Can you hear me in the back? All right. Hey, it's great to be back. Thank you so much for having me. I, I don't know what to say. I'm so touched by the turnout. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best to make it uh, worth your while. Um, you know, uh, we recently just released a new movie uh, that talks about the concepts of recovery management. Um, Pleasure and Wellbeing was kind of about the problem, what goes on in the brain when people become addicted. This movie is a little bit more about the solution. You know, what is it that successful people do in recovery? And, and uh, the last time I was here was October 2014. And I was trying to write the, the screenplay, and it, and it really wasn't going very well. And, and uh, I've, never had a lot of, I've never had a lot of success with that lecture. Uh, this lecture everyone likes. Everyone likes to learn about the brain. Everyone wants to know what's going on in, in their head. And so usually, usually, after the lecture, uh, people are jazzed and they're kind of, and then I'd say, okay, well, that's about the problem. Let's talk about the solutions. Let's talk about recovery management, the things that people do to, so that they can get into long-term recovery. No one likes that lecture. Uh, in fact, I tend to burn through a lot of the goodwill that I, uh, that I, that I earned in the first lecture. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, anyhow, yeah, I was having trouble and it really was sounding preachy and, and it wasn't going well. And I decided to do that lecture in this room for you, and it was really in this room that the ideas kind of coalesced. And so I'm always going to be very grateful to you. I'm always going to remember Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor because uh, it was really uh, you guys that helped me, uh, you know, put it all together for the second film. I hope the second film does better than the than the second lecture has. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but when it comes to this lecture, uh, this is, you know, this is sort of the topic um, that, that, uh, that explains exactly or tries to explain, at least give an idea of the research that's explaining what's going on in the brains of people with addiction. I know a, lot, a little bit about a whole bunch, uh, and so um, uh, uh, this lecture just tries to summarize all of that research. We're going to go through a lot of slides. I think there's nearly 200 in this deck. Uh, we may not get to all of them, uh, but we're going to talk about some, I think, some interesting things. If you would like the slide deck, I believe it's available on the Dawn Farm website. If you would like any of the journal articles that I'm going to be quoting tonight, you know, I'd be glad to send those to you as well. I'll make sure that my, uh, my email uh, is up here. It's just for you if you want to write it down. It's Kevin T. McCauley, M-C-C-A-U-L-E-Y at hotmail.com. And uh, my feeling is, is that this information belongs to everyone. And there really hasn't been a good conduit from all this fascinating research, all this thing, the amazing things that we've discovered about the brain, to the people who really need it, families and people uh, needing recovery and, and in recovery. And so that's what this lecture tries to do. You know, if, if I was trying to come up with a disease that was as confusing and, and it took as long to figure out and spread as much hate and discontent, I'm not sure I could have come up with a better disease than addiction. It seems almost weirdly designed to do as much damage as possible to the individual, to their family, to their community, even to their country. So if you pretend for a second, let's pretend, that I am not a good doctor and that I did not graduate from a medical school uh, dedicated to the welfare of humankind, Pretend for a second that I am an evil doctor, right? And I went to an evil medical school, kind of like this guy, right? Oops. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, this isn't working. Um, and so pretend for a second that as an evil class project in evil medical school, we were asked to come up with the most evil disease that we could think of. And by evil, I don't mean that the patient is evil. I mean that the disease makes you think that the that's part of the evil nature. If I were to sit down with pen and paper and try and come up with that disease, what would it look like? Well, the first thing I would do is I would make its status as a disease already in question. So the minute you started talking about, oh, this is a disease, people would roll their eyes and go, oh, brother, that's stupid. How could you believe that that's a disease? So before we even got out the starting gates, there would already be hate and discontent, right? The second thing I'd do is I would make it run in families but without any particular pattern to it, right? It would, it would hop around, it would affect one sibling, but not another. That way it could do as much damage as possible to that family. Keep everybody guessing, why Jim and not Joe, right? 
I would create a disease that had symptoms that were so repulsive that they were more easily confused with just willful bad behavior, right? I would create a disease that in most, uh, that, that as, as the disease progressed, right, the person would lose insight into just how sick they were. Everyone around them could see it, but the patient couldn't, right? That would be part of the pathophysiology of the disease, okay? This would not, this would not be a disease that, that uh, people could get, that, that uniformly people got better from. Uh, some people would get worse, some people would even die, but a large chunk, and there is some debate as to how large this chunk is, a large chunk of the people with this disease would just kind of get better on their own. They wouldn't need treatment, they would just kind of, if you like, mature out uh, of the disease over time, right? I wouldn't create an acute disease. It could be treated with a single hospitalization. This would be a chronic disease. The patient would carry the diagnosis in some form or another for the rest of their life. Uh, some people might relapse, other people you know, have less of a relapsing pattern, but the disease would never quite go away, right? I would create a disease, this is this evil disease again, that was as culturally and politically divisive as possible. It would go right to the heart of that society's most cherished notions and beliefs. Imagine a disease, if you can, of liberty, a disease of freedom. We are Americans. These are holy words to us. We print them on our money. How would a nation that was so conceived in those values react to a group of its citizens who had a disease in those very values? Would it react well? Would it react poorly? Would it incarcerate them by the hundreds of thousands? And finally, I would create a disease that would only finally give way to weird solutions, solutions that traditional medicine didn't recognize. For instance, the patients themselves getting together and helping each other stay healthy. People as part of the healing process would really need to examine themselves and, and look at their behavior and their values. And maybe as part of that healing process, they might have a deep, personal, transformative experience, a, a spiritual change, if you will. And so you can see the disease of addiction involves all of these things, right? And I think that, that the problem was is that it's, it's, it's designed almost to be as, as confusing and as difficult to figure out as possible. And I think it, we were always up against you know, a huge amount. I mean, I think it was always going to take 100 years into modern medicine before we could start to, to really tease this apart. But now we have begun to tease this apart. And when we study addicts, we study some of the most amazing things that, that are part of the human condition. I really do believe that it's when we look at addicts whose brains are damaged that we learn secrets about how free will actually operates in the brain. How does the brain do that? And so addicts aren't supposed to give very much to society. Sometimes their behavior is so awful we can hardly even recognize them as patients. But addicts actually give something very precious to the world, to the human species. They teach us how choice works. It's by examining them that we learn these secrets. So one of the debates that has always fascinated me has been this question over whether or not addiction is a disease. It's a deceptively difficult uh, puzzle to try to take apart. Everybody's got an opinion one way or the other. Almost all of those opinions are wrong, okay? I don't really have, I'm not an evangelist one way or another. I don't have a need to convince everybody that addiction's a disease, but I think it is important to be able to defend one's position, right? I meet lots of people who have wonderful sobriety, better sobriety than I have, sobriety I wish I had, okay? Uh, and they don't believe that addiction's a disease, so I don't necessarily think that it's a requirement, but I do think that it helps to kind of go through the process of you know, examining it one way or the other. This is basically, the, uh, the, uh, the line of battle, if you like. Uh, you've got people who believe that addiction's a disease and people who believe that addiction's a choice. It's the people over here, I think, that win on the gut level. The choice argument is extremely strong in its intuitive appeal. And basically it says, you know, addicts can quit pretty much any time they want. They might tell you that they're powerless, but they can stop any time they want. For instance, if, if you put a bottle of alcohol in front of the alcoholic and you would offer it up to them, and of course they're an alcoholic, so they can't help themselves. They reach out for that bottle. You can get them to stop. You can say, oh, but Mr. Alcoholic, if you do choose to take that drink, then I'm gonna pull out my nine millimeter and I'm gonna blow your brains out. And most people faced with a gun to the head 
will choose not to drink, right? And that's something you can't do with real diseases. You can't do that with diabetes. You can't put a gun to the head of the diabetic and expect them to bring their blood sugar down. It's, it's not going to work. And so there seems to be something about uh, addiction, right, that, uh, that, 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 you know, it does respond to punishment and coercion in a way that we think most diseases don't. And so people will say that addiction is a behavior, therefore it's a choice, free will exists, the person can stop anytime they want, whereas symptoms, all right, they do not involve choice, there's no free will involved here, the person can't choose to have, can't choose not to have the symptoms. It's a good argument, it's a fascinating argument, it's actually something I call Horvath's Dilemma because I first heard it from Tom Horvath in San Diego, he's a very... Uh, a very good psychologist and an opponent of the idea that addiction is a disease. Um, and when I first heard it, I thought, well, that's it. It just makes so much sense that, that you know, it's, it's, uh, it's got to be true. But as I thought about it and I teased it apart, much as probably what you're doing right now, there were some problems with the choice argument. And I think in the long run, the argument is, is stronger over here. But anytime we talk about addiction, we have to face certain facts, certain things that we know that aren't necessarily comfortable. For instance, there's a study done by Dr. Sir at UCLA who's basically been looking at opioid, a small group of opioid addicts, over the long term. And what she says is that very often people's addiction will follow sort of what's called a life course. It sort of evolves over time. And a certain number of the people, even though they meet the criteria for this very severe IV, you know, heroin addiction, they, they can tend to mature out. Now, what the percentages are, that, that's, you know, something that's up to debate. But Dr. Sir says that you can expect some people to get worse over time, some people to kind of stay in the middle, and some people to uh, um, uh, mature out, if you like, on their own, right? And so in her study, what she found was that there was a, a de definite pattern into how these people did over time. And it's a powerful study. It studied folks for, for quite a while, right? And let me just give you the, the ending graph, okay? So of all of those people who met the criteria for opioid dependence, and it turns out there, you know, marijuana follows this rule, and, and, uh, and so does cocaine, right? You've got people who are severe users and less severe users, and you can kind of expect a certain number of the less severe users just to kind of, you know, uh, stay at that level over time, okay? You can expect some of the severe users to get better, some of the less severe users to get worse, and, and then some people will just kind of stop and stay stopped. And this is a pattern that I want you to take a peek at because we're going to see it time and time again. And that's just something that, that we have to admit. I was taught in addiction, in, in treatment rather, that addiction is invariably a chronic, progressive, and less, less treated fatal disease. And it seems now we know a little bit more about the epidemiology of how this actually plays out. And it's, it's more complex than that. There are people who seem to get better on their own without treatment. And we have to find a way to explain that. We have to figure out, you know, how is that, how is that possible, all right? Probably one of the most articulate spokespeople against the idea of addiction being a disease is Gene Heyman. He's written a book called Addiction is a Disorder of Choice, or, uh, yeah, Disorder of Choice. And he uh, essentially takes into uh, to task Project Match, which is a very large study that took people who met the criteria for alcohol use disorder and matched them to different kinds of treatment, one of them being 12-step facilitation. And they found that really the treatments were all kind of equally good or bad. There was no difference between the two of them. And what Heyman says is that you can't use that data to really get a good picture of what alcoholism looks like in the general population because you're looking at people who are already sick. They were already in treatment. They were already hospitalized. And so he says that the rule is really one of maturing out over time, and it's not the exception. And that begs the question, if addiction is a chronic disease, how is it possible that a large number of people are just getting better? Well, my answer back would be, first of all, I think that's a very good argument. I think that that's true for, for much of the studies we've done. It is, uh, it's called Berkson's bias. When you only look at the sickest people, you get a distorted view of how the disease actually plays out in the entire population. But here's the problem. There are lots of other diseases that do that too. The flu is a disease that most people get better from, okay? Um, but a certain number of people, very young, very old, the immunocompromised, 
they will develop a much worse problem and die. And so that doesn't mean that the flu isn't a disease. That doesn't mean that the flu isn't the ninth leading cause of death in the United States. So I, I have a, a lot of respect for the people making the choice argument. I think their, their, their arguments are important to listen to. They say something that we might have you know, missed or, or haven't been uh, thinking about. But, uh, but Heyman's point and then the further research by Lopez Quintero shows that the overall rule is one of stopping uh, over time. And this really comes into conflict with a lot of the other things that, uh, that we know uh, about addiction, certainly our own personal experience. Probably the, the book that's getting the most play right now is written by a Canadian neuroscientist by the name of Mark Lewis. And he takes to task the whole idea that addiction is a disease at all. That really it's more of just an, an adaptation. It's something that the brain does. And he points out that all these studies that are done by people like Nora Volkoff, the head of uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse, that show brain changes on functional MRI or PET, just because you show a change in the brain, that doesn't necessarily make it pathologic. And Lewis's argument is that really addiction is just a, a really, really severe form of, of learning, right? But the very, very process that got people into addiction, okay, the neuroplasticity that it was involved in sort of cementing the addiction, it can grow past that. You can actually use that very same plasticity to come out. I like that idea that you can use the very same system or the very same process that got you into it to get out. Um, but I think that you know, if you, if you ju just sort of back up and look at the problem uh, on the population level, then you've got real you know, issues. Uh, my feeling is that, uh, that Dr. Lewis is, is you know, not really separating out what changes can be pathologic and what changes are normal. The person who's, he's a researcher on learning, so the person who's the world's expert on learning is Eric Kandel. He's a Nobel, Nobel Prize winner. Um, and when I first read Dr. Lewis's book, I said, wow, wouldn't it be interesting to know what Eric Kandel thinks about this? Very, very compelling argument. And fortunately, uh, Gustavus University had a, had a conference on the neuroscience of addiction, and there on a panel was Eric Kandel and Mark Lewis. And it's a very painful uh, one-hour thing to watch, I think partly because <laughs> Dr. Lewis didn't really get a good chance to make his argument but Dr. Kandel was just kind of met with bafflement that why isn't it that you can't see that this is a disease? Why don't you understand that, you know, that there's a genetic component and that there are components that involve the, the frontal cortex? And I, I, I think that, that that's kind of where I stand too about a lot of these counter arguments is that uh, they found a little piece, okay, that, that we got wrong about addiction, and they kind of focused on that and said, it's, this means it's not a disease, and I, I don't think that that's true. We'll talk a little bit uh, later about the Rat Park study, which is getting a lot of uh, play right now um, because of a TED Talk uh, on it. So, you know, like I said, I think that this is an important question. I've thought about pretty much little else, at least professionally, over the last 15 years. I will, some of you know my story, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I'll tell you how I kind of started thinking about this. I, I used to be a flight surgeon in the Navy. Uh, I took care of a squadron of fighter jet pilots, and it was a great job, I loved it, but in the course of my flying duties, I had to have a surgery, and I was given a prescription for this stuff. Now, we know that a certain number of people that you give oxycodone to do not really get a euphoric response. They don't like it. I would say about three to four out of 10 people that you give you know, something like oxycodone to, they crawl under their skin. They say, this is awful. Don't, don't give me this drug anymore, doc. I'll just suffer with my tooth pain. The next three to four after that, they have what I would call little e euphoria. They go, wow, that's great. And that's the end of it. They, they get up the next day, they don't lose their family or their house or anything like that. It's, a, it's an experience and, and it's an intense one, but it quickly goes in the past, back of their mind. There are some people, though, that you give oxycodone to, and it is a life-changing experience. And they have what I would call big E euphoria. They go, wow, that is amazing. I'm going to do this until the day I die. And I was one of those patients. And now we kind of know a little bit more about why that might be. There might be polymorphisms in the mu receptor, but that, that hyper euphoric response on the first taking of an, of an opioid is a definite risk factor for addiction. And so it wasn't long before I was 
forging prescriptions to get uh, Demerol. The Navy finally caught me and put me in their little treatment center for drug addicts. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> you find yourself sitting in prison. <laughs> and uh, this is actually a picture of Alcatraz, uh, but it, it, it looked almost exactly like that. And you know, I'm sitting in this cell, you know, with this question on my mind. You know, is this really a disease? How did a nice guy like me get here? Uh, you know, does this mean I'm a sociopath or is there really a, a process behind? So are there chemical brain reasons for why I'm going through these things and, and still, even at this moment, <laughs> want to use drugs, cannot seem to stop thinking about drugs. And so uh, this was the year 1997 and I, I basically set out to try to learn everything that there was to know about addiction. And back then you could still do that, today you can't. Uh, and Really, I, I realized I'd been given a great gift, which is to live in the time that we can start to, to, to pick these things apart. And so here's my, I'm going to take all this neuroscience and summarize it into three basic sentences. And, and I think you're on very firm ground if you keep these three sentences in mind if you're trying to understand addiction. The first is that addiction is fundamentally a disorder in the brain's ability to properly perceive pleasure. Okay? So addiction is a broken pleasure sense, a hedonic dysfunction, if you want to get technical about it, right? And so in the same way that a blind person can't perceive light correctly, addicts cannot perceive pleasure correctly. And that negatively influences their ability to assess future value and future risk. And that undermines our ability to make choices. So addiction starts out as a disorder of pleasure and ends up as an impairment in decision making, a broken choice system, right? And so when I have a pleasurable experience, okay, let's say the yum of grandma's amazing chocolate cake, I put her cake into my mouth and I say yum, and then I make a decision to have a second piece of chocolate cake, even though I'm trying to stick to my diet, right? That's a process that goes on in my brain. I don't feel the different systems coming together to create that pleasurable experience and a choice based on it, right? But it involves different areas of the brain and what addiction is is that process coming unraveled, okay? So that's why I titled the movie Pleasure Unwoven because that's sort of what addiction is, is that the very careful choreography that the brain needs to have a hedonic experience and make a choice kind of comes unraveled, right? And I think the third, and I promise the last, most important sentence to take away from all this research is that this defect which starts out in these lower areas of the brain and then as the problem builds becomes a problem in the higher areas of the brain. But that primary defect in the reward system is caused by stress, particularly early stress, early life stress, which we might call, which are now called adverse childhood experiences. They have a particularly pernicious effect on the formation of the dopamine system specifically and that's what sort of sets in motion this risk, this vulnerability, that if a person is exposed to a drug or really anything that's pleasurable, it could uh, be used uh, as a stress coping mechanism. So this is a study done by the Department of Health of the state of Minnesota, just trying to get an idea of how, how prevalent adverse childhood experiences are. And when you're talking about the less severe ones, they're very, very prevalent. But as you move into the more severe ones, we figure it's about 10%, and that's about the prevalence of addiction in the general population, depending on how you measure it, about 10 to 14, maybe 16%, all right? And it turns out that these adverse childhood experiences almost have a dose-response relationship when it comes to your lifetime risk of becoming, say, an alcoholic. So if I have zero, I have a certain risk, I have one, two, three, it almost follows a line. But the, by the time I, I have a, a, a number, good number of these adverse childhood experiences, my risk of lifetime, my lifetime risk of addiction is very high. And it, it's not just addiction. It's not just mental illness. These early, severe, unmanaged stressors have a, have a relationship with one's risk of forming, of, of developing diabetes, heart disease, and, and cancer, 
right? So adverse childhood experience, early life adversity, seems to be like a nexus through which a whole bunch of chronic diseases are operating, not just addiction. Now, there are a lot of people who come to me and they say, Doc, that's fascinating, but I got to tell you, I don't think I had any adverse childhood experiences. I grew up in a great home. My parents were very loving, but I definitely think I'm an alcoholic. How do you explain that? Well, it's tough. We don't want to make the, the data fit the explanation. Um, but it seems that intoxication itself is enough of a stressor that it can sort of, that, that it can flip the brain into this vulnerable state, specifically into this problem with dopamine and what I mean uh, more specifically is dopamine receptors. So now we have a good working model in medicine of what's going on in addiction. This is the American Society of Addiction Medicine's definition of addiction. It's actually an 11 page document. I would love to send it to you. It is a beautiful document. It, it summarizes the, the research about addiction very well and it speaks very eloquently, I think, to the things that addicts suffer with and overcome. This is just my one, par my one paragraph summation of that 11 page document. And it's a busy slide. What I want you to take away from it now is that we've got more than one thing failing at the same time in the brain. Addiction is at least five, maybe more, things going wrong. And so if we want to understand addiction, we have to understand all of these systems. We have to keep them floating in our head at the same time if we really want to understand what's go at, the, at the center of our experience of, say, like craving or whatever just came out of our loved one's mouth who has a problem with addiction. And so we have to understand what goes on at the level of genetics, what goes wrong, okay? We have to understand what goes on in the very deep reward structures of the brain, okay? We have to understand how they affect learning and memory, okay? And so what is it that, that goes wrong in the level uh, of learning and memory, all right? We have to understand how stress plays into this. And do you see what we're doing? We're just climbing levels of brain processing until finally we find ourselves in the frontal cortex, the part of our brain that processes personality, emotional functioning, and makes decisions, all right? Genes reward memory stress choice at least five different things, and they're like dominoes that fall, and by the time we're up in the frontal cortex, things have really gone badly. Now, I didn't make these five things up. They correspond to kind of the, the five dominant theories right now. There's more than five, but these are sort of the dominant ones that uh, explain addiction. These are good names to know. I plug them into uh, uh, PubMed, that's the search engine for the National Institute of Health, uh, every quarter or so, because these folks usually publish pretty good uh, uh, summary, re you know, review articles, uh, and that's a good way of kind of keeping up with the research. You can usually read the first, you know, uh, a couple pages, then I kind of get lost, um, but, uh, but definitely, you know, uh, we've got, a, this is a very, very solid research base, uh, quite a bit of it actually done here at the uh, University of Michigan some of the key research, we'll talk about it. So when I think about addiction, I basically think about these different areas of the brain that are failing at the same time. One by one, they shut down. And since I, I tend to like movies, I, I'm, not, I'm not a filmmaker, I don't really know what I'm doing when I make movies, but I like movies. And, uh, and so I always try to think of you know, something uh, from a good film uh, to try to explain this. Did you ever see that movie 2001 A Space Odyssey? Right, and, and if you know the movie, some of you are so young you probably don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> but uh, they're in space on a spaceship headed for Jupiter and the computer basically tries to kill all the astronauts, right? And, and he thought he got this one astronaut out in space but he, the astronaut found a way to get back into the spacecraft and he's pissed. <laughs> and so he goes to the memory banks of the computer and he's gonna shut down the computer and it's, it's actually probably one of the most famous and best death scenes in, in the history of cinema. Uh, and basically he uh, turns the computer off and the computer feels his mind going as he unlock, as he, uh, um, there we go, as he unlocks each one of these different uh, modules. This is the way I see the patient who's in active craving, right? One by one, the areas of the brain are failing, and so uh, 
what we see on the outside is this behavior that's very unpleasant. Um, what recovery is, is essentially putting these modules back into place and, and having them function correctly. So when we ask the question, what is addiction? What's going on in the brain in addiction? We're asking some really big questions. What is the nature of choice? Well, how does the brain value things? How does risk taking play into this, right? Uh, do, do addicts have a problem with empathy? Are they narcissists or are they oversensitive? Let me tell you something that is just gonna shock you, but I like to say this because I like to shock audiences. Um, if you really sit down with heroin addicts and you treat them as an equal and you get to know them, far from heroin addicts being predatory little sociopaths who don't care about the feelings and people around them, this is what I was taught in medical school, what you find, and I think probably you know this, is that heroin addicts are sweet people they are exquisitely sensitive to the feelings in people around them. In fact, there's even a word for it now. It's called hypercadiophia, which is the extreme emotional sensitivity that can go along with active opioid use and becomes especially acute when the person tries to quit, all right? They, the problem with opioid addicts is that they can't really tell where the pain of the world stops and their pain begins, and they try and take it all on and that doesn't work. And if that's your dominant problem, pain, what better drug to take than an analgesic? Something that is good you know, at relieving both physical and emotional pain. And so I think you know, there's a lot of truth to be found uh, in the science of addiction. And what my, my general feeling is that um, the diseases against the idea that addiction, uh, yeah, the, the arguments against the idea that addiction is a disease basically boil down to a refusal to believe that choice is something that could become diseased, right? And I don't think that's a very scientific question. I think that's a political question, or that's a religious question, right? But volition, free will, choice, whatever you want to call it, is a capacity of the brain. The brain is a, a natural organ. It can break, and so can our ability to, uh, to, to make choices, right? So a lot of people will make the disease argument and say, well, it, it works better when we call addiction a disease. You know, more people come to treatment, right? They're asking a tele or they're making a teleologic argument, right? That, you know, when we call addiction, it does nice things, good things. I'm not asking a teleologic question. I'm asking an ontologic question. Could a disease of choice exist? Is that something that is possible in the natural world? And I can't see any reason why not. And so most, you know, pretty much all of the diseases, arguments against the idea that addiction is a disease boil down to that simple thing. And so if you understand that choice is something that can come and go, right? It can become diseased. It can also come back. The same thing is true for the heart. If a patient has aortic stenosis, some days they can climb a flight of stairs and some days they can't without chest pain. Why should the brain be any less complex? There are periods where I can say, no, I don't want to use drugs. And it looks like I'm making a choice. And if I continue to make that choice and then I'm successful, that could be a form of abstinence. That could be a form of recovery. All right? But there are times when our ability to make decisions collapses. And, and it's, it's not all the time. It comes and goes. It can fluctuate even from hour to hour. But that's what seems to be happening in addiction. And so when we look at addiction on the outside, what, if you're a parent, this is what you see, we're pretty much up in these higher areas of the brain in the frontal cortex, right? So the primary defect of addiction is down here, but it causes problems downstream, right? So for choice to work, the reward system has to be working perfectly. It has to be functioning, firing on all 12 cylinders. If you, if you break reward, break pleasure, choice goes next, all right? Now, I have this fear, it's an irrational fear, that my addiction will simply be reduced to the idea that I'm a, a sociopath, that I'm, that I'm a liar, cheat, and a thief. That's what I was taught in medical school. Addicts use drugs the way they do because they are essentially a variant of antisocial personality disorder. That, to this day, still freezes my blood. There's no evidence that there's a such thing as an addict personality. I think it's very, uh, uh, um, it's, it's wrong. It's just flat out wrong. But I tend to like to stay down here, 
okay, when I think about addiction, and stay well out of the personality area of the brain. Uh, but the fact of the matter is I have to be true to the science. There are things about the frontal cortex which fail in addiction, and they may have already been damaged before I ever used my drug. And so I don't think that these things rise to the level of personality, but there are a number of traits, at least, that seem to predict early use and age of first use is an extremely important determinant in one's lifetime risk of addiction, right? And so, you know, I can't deny that. And some of these things you can see at a very early age, right? Long before drug use. So you've probably heard of the famous Stanford marshmallow experiment. The, mar the experiment works like this. You ask the parent to bring their kid in and you tell them, don't feed him, don't feed him breakfast, bring him in hungry. And you sit the kid down and you say, would you like a marshmallow? And of course the kid wants a marshmallow. Who doesn't want a marshmallow? But the adult then says, I'm going to go down the hall for a few minutes, right? And when I get back, if the marshmallow is still there, I'll give you a second marshmallow. And some kids can do it, <laughs> and some kids can't. <laughs> now it seems the people who are successful distract themselves from the marshmallow. They think about other things. The kids who are not successful expose themselves to marshmallow cues. They, they touch the marshmallow. That's a bad strategy. Don't do that, all right? They, this, oh, this is my favorite kid. She figures that if there is some marshmallow remaining when the adult gets back, that that should count as a marshmallow, and she should get her marshmallow, all right? This, is, this next kid is me, the kid with ADHD, does not even wait for the instructions. <laughs> Whatever, lady. <laughs> Something about it, like, talk to the hand, I'm eating my marshmallow, right? And it, and it turns out <laughs> that this simple test of delayed gratification, of the ability to delay one's gratification uh, at four, can predict a whole bunch of other things, like one's SAT scores, one's educational attainment, and yes, sadly for me, one's BMI. All right, so there do seem to be things that are not quite right in the frontal cortex long before the person becomes addicted. When the person becomes addicted, these problems get much, much worse, and there are at least three, probably more, but at least three areas of the brain that we need to think about when we consider active addiction, when that patient is in active craving, all right? The first is called the orbitofrontal cortex, right here above the eyeballs, okay? This is the part of the brain where we give things value, right? People who have strokes in the orbitofrontal cortex lose the ability to correctly, they can't guess the price of consumer objects, right? And that may seem like a, you know, a small thing. You can't guess the price of something. You're terrible on the game show, the price is right, big deal. But their entire emotional functioning falls apart, right? They lose their jobs, they lose their friends, they can't, you know, they get divorced. And so our ability to properly value is a very important component of volition, of choice. And if you break valuation, you've essentially lost the steering mechanism for choice, right? Another area of the brain that is affected in addiction, negatively, is called the anterior cingular cortex. This area of the brain essentially picks up on social cues and helps me guide my behavior. Another way of thinking about this is that this is the part of my brain where I observe myself through your eyes, right? So as I stand up here and I, I give this lecture, I've got a relatively good idea of how I'm doing. <laughs> Losing a couple people, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> got some friends, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> I can do that, all right? I can self-assess because I've got this area of my brain. When I use drugs, I lose that and my behavior becomes socially atrocious, all right? If you wanna know what this looks like, those of you who are family members, you probably don't need any reminding, but if you ever wanna explain it to somebody, tell them to turn on that television show, Intervention. And when you see that otherwise loving young man use the F word with his grandmother, <laughs> know what you're watching. You're watching a person have a stroke, or, or at least a really, really bad TIA. And I, I don't like this show, I think you're filming people at what must surely be the worst moments of their life when they can consent to nothing, let alone having the worst moments of their life filmed for a national television audience. And the other thing that the show doesn't indicate is that this can be fixed. There are things that I can do to recalibrate 
my social cognition. There are many ways to do this. My way, one way, is to go to these meetings, these endless and interminable meetings that just go on and on and on. Uh, and over the weeks and months and years, I come to know a group of other sober men, okay? A group of surrogate anterior cingulate cortices, right? <laughs> and I can bounce my behavior off them, and it's in the intensity, sometimes painful intensity of that social interaction that I can start to repair this problem here, okay? But that is definitely one of the areas of the brain that in the heat of addiction is lost, okay? Another area of the brain that seems to be important is the anterior, or is it the insular cortex, all right? You've probably heard of these studies where people who were severe smokers, okay, had a stroke here, and they just forgot that they were smokers. They didn't even go through nicotine withdrawal. They were two and three pack a day smokers. When they woke up in the hospital and their loved one said, oh, I'm so glad you're back, would you like a smoke? <laughs> they said, why would I want to smoke? <laughs> because, because you're a smoker. <laughs> they forgot, all right? What the insular cortex seems to do is it attaches our consciousness to our body. And if you break that, you could do something like forget that you're a smoker. This is a part of the brain that is faulty in addiction, and it may be what's behind craving. It may also be behind the uh, tendency for people to deny their problems uh, when they're an alcoholic or an addict, even when they're faced with them, right? So we've, we've got a number of these areas of the brain that we have to kind of keep in mind. When they work together, we can make decisions that you know, uh, are in keeping with our goals and our values, all right? Addiction is a disorder of this system, all right? So that's where we're going to end up in the cortex, all right? Now I wanna go all the way back and talk about what happens at the level of the very, very small, all right, at the level of genetics. Addiction is a genetic disorder. I think you, you know that. At least 50% of the vulnerability is purely genetic. We came into the world with it, right? There are certain genes that give us vulnerabilities, other genes that give us resiliences as we go through life in terms of whether or not we're going to form addiction. And Mark Shuckett at UC San Diego has found one. He's doing a very large study on sons of alcoholics, very powerful, what's called prospective cohort study, where you get the cohort and you follow them forward in time for years, decades, sometimes longer than the life of the principal investigator. And if they get the disease or don't get the disease, you can use that data to go back and assess what's a risk factor, right? So the framing study was a prospective cohort study uh, and taught us most of the risk factors uh, for heart disease. One of the risk factors for addiction, for alcoholism specifically, is being a low responder genetically to alcohol. So it takes more beer to get you drunk. Those people have a higher likelihood of becoming alcoholic, so this would be a vulnerability, right? If you're a high responder, one beer, drunk. I guess we all know such people, right? Uh, the high responders have a resilience against becoming alcoholics. So I think the thing to take away from here is that there really are genes that can determine differences in how drugs feel from person to person. And we're starting to figure this out. We're starting to figure out that there's a difference in the way people metabolize opioids. There's a difference in the risk of that innocent Vicodin or oxycodone prescription uh, to some patients, right? And unfortunately, this is what's happened today is that Right around the same time I was graduating from medical school, we were trying to get better at pain relief. We were told, hey, don't leave patients in unnecessary pain. That happened at the same time some new formulations of opioids were coming on the market. And that risk, that, that stressor, if you like, fell upon the general population of American young people, and it just extracted the people who were uh, you know, likely to, to, to develop a problem. And that's what we're seeing today. And so it's important to understand that there really are genetic differences in how uh, a person responds to these drugs, right? Where things get interesting is when you start looking at the epigenetics of addiction. Now, I, I admit, I understand this imperfectly, but the way it's been explained to me is that epigenetics is a way of taking information about the present and sending it into the future. So the most famous epigenetic study ever done is called the Overcalix study. Overcalix is this tiny little town in the very northern part of Sweden, way above the Arctic Circle, right? 
So I, I used to live in Park City. That's a pretty cold place. This is seriously cold, all right? Freeze a moose dead cold, colder than outside, all right? So the people in this town were always living on the edge of survival, all right? But the thing that Overcalix had was exquisite records going back several hundred years. And what the epidemiologists who looked at these records found, right, is that if a young man, okay, in a particular window of development, seven to 14 years of age, if a young man went through a period of food scarcity, so let's say one winter, almost all of the people in Overcalix died of star starvation, almost all of them, right? They almost died. If he went through that period of food scarcity, the rate of diabetes went down in his grandson. Not in him, not in his son, in his grandson. If a young woman in the same window of development was exposed to food scarcity, the rate of diabetes went up in her granddaughter. Not in her, not in her daughter, but in her granddaughter. And so what this told us, this, this closed a huge gap in our questions about addiction. What this told us is that stressors can be severe enough that they affect, uh, uh, that they can have an effect transgenerationally, right? Trauma is heritable. We've always understood that the Holocaust, people who survived the Holocaust had a higher rate of PTSD. That certainly makes sense. We've understood, you know, basically, while their children would have a higher rate of PTSD, but why do their grandchildren have a higher rate of PTSD, right? And so this is something that we really need to look at. We were thrown into the world, not just with the choices and stressors that we were faced personally, but we still carry that legacy of stressors in previous generations. And these are what are called epigenetic changes. They're not genetic changes. They don't affect the DNA code itself. They affect things that are attached to it, like DNA methylation, right? So stressors in the environment can cause an increased amount of this DNA methylation. There are a couple of others. And that can affect how tightly the DNA is wrapped when the cell divides. And if it's wrapped very tightly, Okay, a person might have the gene for something, but it's wrapped so tightly that the mechanisms of transcription can't get in there and turn it into a protein. So the person has the genotype, but they don't express the phenotype, right? Other epigenetic changes leave the DNA very unwrapped. The, D the, the gene is there, it's readily turned into a protein, okay? And so that can be what pr produces, when you add it all together, that can be what produces the difference in disease expression down the road, right? So this is kind of depressing news. And when I talk to patients about it, they, they get upset, especially parents who are in treatment. They're already very feeling very guilty. Now they realize that they could pass on their alcoholism, right? And I've had a number of parents come up to me with tears in their eyes saying, is there nothing I can do? Is, it, is my son going to become an alcoholic just like me? You got to be careful how you introduce patients to this information, right? I think, you know, if you just put it up there, then it's pretty depressing. But I think there's a way of reframing it that I think is much better. It's more a tactic used in motivational interviewing. And the answer sounds more like this. Listen, there's nothing I can do about your genes or your epigenes. That, that's just the way we are, right? There's nothing that I can do about the fact that your child you know, saw you drink or that you drank while you were pregnant. But here's something else your child will see. Your child will get you, see you get sober. Everything that you do, every sober day that you put on top of the next, that benefit goes to your child too, along with the terrible, awful alcoholic genes. And so the good news about these epigenetic is that they are quite reversible in a way that genetic changes themselves are not, right? And so I, I think, you know, I'm going to make this statement I think it's possible that, you know, if I have the genes for alcoholism and I become an alcoholic and I die, that's not so good. But if I have the genes for alcoholism and I become an alcoholic and I recover, that's very, very good. Because that's an adaptation. And biology loves adaptations. And I think I can make the statement that if a person has this genetic, you know, or this, this genetic problem, 
but then they develop the skills of recovery, which themselves are heritable, okay, uh, that might actually be a greater benefit in the long run, right? So when people get sober, it matters. It matters to not just them, but to their family and their community. I, I tell patients this. Listen, I know you're here in treatment, and I know things look pretty black right now. <laughs> I realize your family's pretty angry with you. You probably have an aunt or an uncle who never wants to speak to you again. I promise you, this will happen if you get sober. You will, and I don't know if this will happen a year from now or 30 years from now, you will get a call from that family member. And they will say, listen, I realize we've had our differences. We haven't always seen eye to eye on this. Um, but I know that you went through this, and I know that you got sober. We just got a call from our kid's school. He's been kicked out for drugs. Can I ask you some questions? And that's the point at which that person's recovery doesn't just benefit them. It benefits their family and maybe their community and maybe who knows. And so I think you know, the take-home message from this genetics is that it's a very powerful mediator for, for addiction, but it is not itself the cause, all right? We can develop, we can actually you know, sort of develop our own adaptations. We can create acquired resiliencies that offset the damage, okay? All right, but if we have a problem at the level of genetics, once we finally have a brain, we actually, actually have a, you know, a, a brain in its physical form, that problem did not go away. It's still in there, right? It's still in the reward system and how it comes together. So how does the reward system figure into this? Well, if I have a pleasurable experience, let's say the yum of grandma's chocolate cake, all right? Put it into my mouth, I say yum. The very first thing my brain does, this is at the core of every pleasurable experience, is the release of this chemical dopamine from this pathway, the cell bodies are here in the ventral tegmental area. They send their axons up to an area of the ventral striatum called the nucleus accumbens, and they release the chemical that we've all heard of, dopamine. Dopamine is not the only chemical here. It's just the first one. Okay, there's going to be a series of chemicals that will eventually get used. This is what's often called the hedonic cascade of how the brain actually creates the yum of grandma's chocolate cake. Right? All dopamine does is handles just the, the core of that pleasurable experience, namely salience. It gets our attention. It zeroes us in. It says, hey, this is important. Dopamine also tells us if we ever come across a reward that is better than we had expected it would be. So this is what I find so fascinating about addiction. It is very much a disease that requires time to exist, right? You have to have past drug using sessions, you have the immediacy of craving in the present, and you have what you think will happen in the future, right? What's often called fictive imagining, right? So it seems that whenever we stand on the threshold of a choice, right, Addict, non-addict, all of us. What our brain does is it projects itself into the future for the different options in that choice. And very quickly, the brain assesses how good each option will be, how valuable, and how likely each option will be, or unlikely. And it's kind of like a horse race. As the information comes in, the different options are kind of chasing against, or racing against each other. And once one of them reaches a certain threshold, we default to that choice, and it's very hard to pull us out of it once we've made that choice. What addicts have a tendency to do is dramatically overvalue future drug-related rewards and overestimate the probability that they will work out as intended and undervalue the consequences that might result and underestimate the likelihood that those consequences will in fact come true, right? So addicts have a real problem assessing future risk, which is gonna be a real problem as they leave treatment and go out into the community, okay? So think about that patient. You, you might be that patient, I hope not, right? You probably know this patient. If you're treating someone, you probably have treated this patient, maybe even today, the patient who wants to leave. Right? They know they should stay, the job, the family, the probation officer, but they're suffering. There's a pull, leave treatment. Why are you here? Let's go do you know, the drug, right? And they're in this decisional balance. We have to really look at what's going on in their head to understand how their decision-making is collapsing, right? So what does dopamine do? Let me give you an example 
of a bet on the future, okay? Because that's essentially what's going wrong here. A vending machine. Every vending machine is a gamble on the future, right? You're gambling that you're gonna put your money in and a little thing's gonna turn around and you're gonna get your M&Ms, right? And if it doesn't, there's gonna be real trouble, okay? <laughs> so let's say I walk up to this vending machine and I want to buy a bag of Funyuns. Any cannabinoid addicts in the audience? Very popular with cannabinoid addicts, right? If you smoke weed, you like Funyuns, right? <laughs> so Funyuns at this vending machine, let's say they cost a dollar. And I put in my dollar, and due to a freak of vending machine physics, I get two bags of Funyuns. This is when the brain releases dopamine, all right? <laughs> It's a reward, but it's better than expected. And the brain says, hey, look at this. We were expecting one. We got two, we got two. Now pay attention to this. It might be really good for survival. Why don't you put it a little higher on the survival priority list, on its value level, right? That's what dopamine does. If I put in another dollar, and this time I only get one bag of Funyuns, no excess dopamine is released. It's not that the Funyuns aren't pleasurable, they are. I mean, they got fun right in the title, right? <laughs> That's because the other chemicals of the hedonic system will take over. But this reward is not better than expected, so it won't have that, that extra attention, right? Let's say I put in another dollar, and this time I get no Funyuns, right? That will cause a less dopamine to be released because this reward is worse than expected. Of course, if you don't get, if you don't get your Funyuns, that's gonna cause its own set of problems because you're gonna want your Funyuns, right? So this was the research that was done right here, okay, that was able to distinguish that dopamine was not really a chemical of liking, of pleasure, that larger, yum, consummate pleasure that we typically associate with a good thing. It's more about wanting. It's more about the drive, right? And this research was done by Kent Berridge, who basically figured out that Mice did not necessarily enjoy cheese more, okay? They were faster through a maze to get it, all right? And so that's why he said that there are these hedonic hotspots and dopamine is really a chemical more of, of incentive salience, of drive. And I guess the way they did this is that they, they looked at the mouth of the mouse, right? Apparently it's the tongue. There's the universal symbol of liking something. You protrude the tongue, right? And a universal sim uh, 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 symbol of not liking things, like, you know, opening the mouth. Okay, <laughs> who am I to disagree with science, right? So I can just imagine a whole bunch of little graduate students with little magnifying glasses trying to find the, the tongue sign, right? And I guess that's a skill that could translate outside of the lab, right? If you can go to the bar on a Friday night and tell the difference between the person who likes you and actually wants you, that, that might be helpful, right? <laughs> So, so what, what Berridge pointed out is that it's the, the firing of these dopamine neurons that codes for better than expected, and to be more specific, it's the burst firing, right? So these nerves are always kind of firing a little bit, clack, 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 that's a baseline. But if they suddenly fire a whole bunch of time, that burst firing, that is what codes for this is way better than expected, okay? And so it's important to really understand what it is that dopamine does. It helps us recognize things that are good for survival, learn them, and then predict them in the future. And what all drugs of abuse do is cause very, very, very large and fast surges of dopamine at that synapse, right? The system was not meant for this. It was meant for normal releases of dopamine. Going for a walk on the beach, having dessert at your favorite restaurant. What drugs do is they cause this massive surge of dopamine. And so every time I, let's just pick one, smoke crack cocaine, I get a signal that's basically saying this, hold the phone, man, this is way better than expected, even though the drug is not really better than expected. This is really good for survival, even though the drug is actually quite harmful. This is better than anything in the past for survival. Why don't you put this a little higher on the survival priority list, even though the drug shouldn't have that value. And so drugs, especially drugs like cocaine, powerful drugs, heroin that's injected, these drugs basically create an illusion of their own importance. And that's pretty sinister. 
So like I said, these people who are figuring out how choice works in the brain, like Dr. David Reddish, okay, at uh, the University of Minnesota, they're essentially figuring out ways to computer model human choice. And that's how they know that this, this is the way the brain works. You have these different options. The brain quickly projects itself uh, into the future and assesses the value and the likelihood of each option. And once one kind of comes in with enough evidence, we default to that, all right? Now think about what's going on in the brain of that patient who wants to leave treatment, okay? They're not thinking, oh, if I leave here, bad things will happen. They're thinking it's gonna work out perfectly, right? I'm gonna leave here, I'm gonna get that guy on the phone, he'll have the really good stuff, I'm gonna go to the hotel, I'll find a vein, it's gonna be great, all right? So very, very, very high future value of drug-related reward, very, very high overestimation that the probability that the drug will actually work out. So how does that work? Well, let me change from Funyuns to something else now. How about gumballs, specifically yellow gumballs, right? Let's say this gumball machine is real and we walk up to it. What do you think my chances, just looking at that machine right now, would be of getting a yellow gumball on any one quarter? I'd say it's about 10%, all right? So I've got a one in 10 chance of getting a yellow gumball. Fix that probability in your mind because that's reality, it's not going to change. Unfortunately, the addict has had this experience of putting in the quarter, getting two gumballs, okay, the, the euphoria of drug use, right, creates that very powerful surge of dopamine along the pathways of neurons going up from the VTA into various areas of the brain, and nucleus accumbens seem to be the most important. They also go up from there to places like the orbitofrontal cortex, which assesses value, especially future value under shifting conditions of risk. And so it's important to understand that patient does not see this, 10%. He sees this, 20%. He sees this, 33%. He sees this, 100%. <laughs> this is the way human choice collapses. We essentially lose our ability to assess what's good and what's possible in the future. And that is the basic defect at the heart of all the decision-making mistakes that people get. And so it's important, and this is what this new film is about, to understand that, that I can't assess what's risky in the future. I will make mistakes when it comes to that, and that's why I have to depend on other people and systems around me to get me through those dangerous, difficult, those dangerous moments. And so this is the dopamine hypothesis, what, what all drugs of abuse seem to do, okay? They have one thing in common, they're pleasurable, and that means at their core, they have this release of dopamine. Very fast, very powerful release. So it's not just the pharmacokinetics of the, pharmacodynamics of the drug, right? How fast, how much dopamine it releases. It's also the route of administration. So injecting drugs, shooting drugs, and smoking drugs, very, very, very fast surges of dopamine. Right, And so this really, this is a powerful theory because it explains a lot and it predicts a lot, right? So this is why people who have a problem with cocaine who come to treatment fully acknowledging that and they say, that's it, I gotta stop this cocaine, it's out of control. And then they make the state mistake of saying, but doc, I never really had a problem with alcohol, why, why should I stop alcohol? I'll stop the cocaine, but I'm not gonna stop the alcohol. They leave treatment in good faith. They do not use cocaine, they start to drink, they start to binge drink, and very quickly, they relapse back to cocaine. We know why that is, okay? A lot of people who are alcoholics will come to me and they'll say, Doc, I'm a terrible alcoholic. You gotta get me off this alcohol because I'm driving now drunk and I'm getting into fights. I hit my wife last week. I don't wanna do these things, Doc. You gotta get me off the alcohol. Say, Doc, is there any way you could get me off that alcohol by putting me on a marijuana maintenance program? Because <laughs> When I smoke pot, I don't get into fights. I eat a box of cookies and I go to bed, right? <laughs> it makes sense. It makes sense that the toxicity differences alone would justify the switch. You see the problem? I haven't changed anything. The insult, the intoxication is still there, okay? So the burden on the brain has not changed, okay? Now you can probably see where I'm going. There are two drugs that we do not typically 
uh, eliminate from the average treatment experience, right? I'm not going to talk about that. I don't want the Starbucks mafia to come after me, okay? <laughs> I'll talk about this. <laughs> when I was in treatment, I got some very, very wise advice. Don't make any big changes in the first year, okay? I think that's great advice. Unfortunately, it has sort of morphed into this belief that it's bad to quit everything at once. Don't quit smoking. Don't try to quit smoking. You're going to crave more. You're more likely to relapse. It doesn't even matter because most people don't want to quit anyway. What the research shows is exactly the opposite. And it fits very well with the dopamine hypothesis. As long as that surge is in there, even if it's a much smaller but fast surge from nicotine, the insult is not, you know, the insult continues, right? So what the research actually shows is that up to 30% of people who come to treatment for their primary substance use disorder want to quit at the time of admission, but we're not really equipped to ask that or deal with it, right? Uh, people who continue to smoke after treatment report worse cravings. They're more likely to relapse, okay? People who quit smoking in their first year after treatment are more likely to be sober from their primary drug of choice nine years later. So it is a very powerful protective factor to take that surge out, all right? So I think, you know, as an industry, the addiction treatment really needs to, to look at this and understand that this is such a powerful theory that it can actually show us mistakes that we're making now, right? And that's one of them, not dealing with this. Treatments, many treatment centers are, that's good, okay? What that should be, I don't know, I have no idea. I certainly wouldn't yank cigarettes out of people's hands, but we should offer nicotine secession repeatedly and frequently throughout that treatment experience and beyond. Because as long as that's in there, it seems to provide this continued uh, uh, problem. And from a public health level, the drug that is most likely to kill the patients in any given treatment center is not heroin. It's not meth or alcohol, nicotine. And so we really have to have a plan for, yeah, I know, it's bad news, trust me. There's even worse news coming. <laughs> <laughs> we really... We really have to have a plan for the patient who comes to treatment with a pretty bad opioid problem as a non-smoker, but then leaves treatment with that opi opioid problem well in hand, now smoking. That is not good. Now, what's powerful about this theory is that it shows us that it's not just chemicals that do this, behaviors can too. And so this was the power of this theory that is that it, it backed us up. It showed us the full extent of the problem. It showed us why you can sometimes see people quit and then move over here, spend some time over here, have a very high rate of relax back to the drug. They all basically do the same thing. They increase dopaminergic neurotransmission in that pathway from the VTA to the NA, right? Some drugs work right here. They have no middleman, like coke and meth. Right? If you're a coke or meth addict, congratulate yourself. You eliminated the middleman. Right? <laughs> Other drugs work through a back door. Like one of the things that opioids do is it inhibits an inhibitor, which causes more dopamine. And what's interesting is it's not in the relative amount of dopamine. It's not in how fast the dopamine is made or how fast it's transported down. It's in the receptors for dopamine that we see the primary difference. The problem is not in the song. It's in the ear. And what we see in people with addiction is this depletion of a particular kind of receptor called the dopamine D2 receptor in these areas of the brain, okay? That is the fundamental physiologic difference between the addict and the non-addict, okay? And I can say paucity of dopamine receptors in the reward structures of the brain, or I can say childhood, now maybe adult ADHD, because it's the same disease. Or I can say restlessness, irritability, and discontentedness, because it's the same thing. And this is what I see when I go to a meeting. I realize I should keep it simple. I shouldn't do this. But I see people who are long sober from their drug of choice, but they can just tell that something's not quite right. They're just a little off. And they're using the power of the group and shared values right, to cope with this deficit. Right? And I think that's a very beautiful and very humane uh, uh, process, right? 
So we know that the, 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 the how many dopamine receptors you have down in the nucleus accumbens drives the function of the frontal cortex, all right? So if I don't have as many, I just don't do as well. I don't make decisions as well. My, my social functioning isn't quite as good, all right? And that was the power of this theory, to bring it all together. I was trying to find a way to make this part of the lecture go a little faster. And uh, one day I was looking at this thing. Remember this thing from high school chemistry, periodic table of the elements? I came up with a periodic table of the intoxicants. <laughs> and so these are all the intoxicants that you're likely to see in the United States right now. All right? They're arranged according to their class. So the green ones are the opiates and opioids. All right? And as you generally, as you move from the left to the, or the, yeah, from this side to that side, okay? The uh, abusability and the potency goes up, right? The blue ones are the sedative hypnotics, drugs that decrease anxiety and promote sleep. Alcohol is one of them, okay? I just kind of pulled it out, right? So that includes things like Ambien, okay? Uh, quaaludes, if you see a quaalude, you should rush it to the Smithsonian Institution because they're very rare. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they were all taken, <laughs> every single last one. The old-time barbiturates, and then, of course, the benzodiazepines, which are so numerous I couldn't even fit them all in there, right? But they all basically do the same thing, and so if I've got a problem with one, there's a risk that I'll delve a problem with the other, and the process addictions are down here, okay? And the inclusion of pathologic gaming in the DSM-5 uh, under the realization that it's doing the same thing in the brain that these things are doing really, really strengthen this theory, okay? So think about that Rat Park experiment, all right, which was done by Bruce Alexander, another Canadian, oddly enough. I can't figure it out. Um, what, what, what Alexander did is he recognized that if you put mice, rats, whatever, in a Skinner box and gave them the option of using heroin or not, they very quickly became heroin, severely addicted to heroin, right? And that seemed to get worse, you know, uh, and be constant over time, right? But if you put the mice not in this nasty little box, but in a much nicer cage with clean shavings and toys and things like that, plenty of food and other mice to have sex with, right? <laughs> not only would those mice not choose heroin, but the mice that were addicted to heroin, okay, got better. They stopped using heroin when they went into Rat Park. Right? And so the implication is, is that if we put mice and we put humans in an enriched environment, that they won't develop addiction, which I guess is the reason why no rich person ever became an addict. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the point I'm trying to make here is to not shoot down at Dr. Alexander's study, because I think all of these studies say something very important, something that we need to pay attention to about addiction. But who's to say that when you take away the heroin, and give the animal the opportunity to have sex with other animals that it wants, all right, that that isn't just moving over, okay? And so I, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, the drug of choice is really at its heart about sex. And so if you just cut out the middleman, uh, then, you know, it'll stop using heroin, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the addiction is gone. It just might be manifesting itself a different way. All right? It doesn't necessarily mean that the defect, the primary defect, isn't still there. It reminds me of an old joke. My dad was a terrible smoker, horrible, three packs a day. Ugh. And we tried everything to get him off cigarettes. We tried, nothing worked, nothing worked. The only thing that kind of worked was the thing, um, the thing with the needles, what is that called? No, heroin. <laughs> <laughs> he loves that stuff. <laughs> We can't keep them away from it. <laughs> you can always get a person off one drug by moving them over temporarily or even long term to another drug. And that's another uh, feature of this, uh, of the, the uh, dopamine hypothesis. So if you understand this curve, you'll understand so much about addictive behavior. What addicts like to do is go from a state of high stress, low dopamine, to a state of low str lower stress, higher dopamine. And the faster you go from here to here, the more points you get, right? So it's really the slope value of this curve that predicts the addictive potential of the drug, right? Higher the curve, more likely to produce addiction. And that depends on two things, the pharmacodynamics of the drug, what it actually does to the body and creates dopamine uh, release, and the route of administration. 
And we, it seems, as human beings, all right, have always done this. We've always taken these normal and probably safe, mild intoxicants in the natural environment and pushed it, tried to steepen the curve, right? So when nature gave us poppies, did we leave it there? No, we didn't. We bred them and created the opium poppy, right? We didn't even leave it there. We got good at organic chemistry, and we pulled the active ingredient, the codeine, the morphine, out of the raw opium, and then we took the morphine and we boiled it in vinegar. We acetylated it. We created two acetyl groups on the morphine molecule. Why? Morphine is not a very fatty molecule. If you inject it, it'll get you high, but it's going to take a little while for it to really peak. This molecule is extremely fatty. It rockets into the brain very quickly. Here's the problem. It's too bulky a molecule to actually fit in the opioid receptor. So the brain quickly breaks off the acetyl groups. It's morphine again. That binds. That gets you high. What's the difference between this and this? The rush. The surge of dopamine. Okay? And so uh, even though, you know, you, if you want to be technical, there's really no such thing as a heroin high. All heroin is is a delivery vehicle for the morphine, and that produces the difference in abusability and addiction. And it was a very, very popular drug, and it came out right about the same time as this little piece of technology, okay, the hypodermic syringe, which could just bypass the body's defenses entirely. Okay? You didn't need to put it up your butt or put it in alcohol and drink it, or you didn't need to smoke it. You could put it right into the vein. And you'll notice there's no sterile packaging here, right? <laughs> Because this technology predated germ theory, and it was not uncommon for people to actually own and sometimes even carry uh, uh, syringe kits prior to the passage of the Harrison Narcotic Act before there were any federal drug laws. What's the point? The curve. Steepen the curve. That's the danger. Right? As long as that's in the picture, we've got a problem. Before I got into medical school, I went to UC Davis in California, and my major, believe it or not, was enology, which is winemaking. <laughs> Davis sits right next to Napa Valley, and so it's a big deal in California. So I was learning how to essentially ferment grape juice in, into wines and how to package it. And it was a great, I don't use this information anymore, obviously, but one of the things that they taught us to do is how to make champagne. Now, when you make champagne the right way, you make it all in one bottle, okay? Method champenoise. This was invented by a French monk who was trying to take white grape juice and turn it into white wine. And so when he made his white wine, he put it into the bottle, he corked it, but he had not properly clarified it. And so there was still some residual yeast. yeast. As he put it uh, into the racks, they ate the rem remaining sugar, produced carbon dioxide, which built up and burst most of his bottles. Some of his bottles managed to stay corked, the glass held, the carbon dioxide went into solution, and when the monk came down and saw that his batch, his cuvee, was destroyed, but a couple bottles were still good, he opened it up. It foamed. He said, it's like drinking liquid stars. And that monk's name was Dom Pernion, all right? <laughs> it's a very, very romantic thing. It's just sad to, you know, had to sell all those books. <laughs> why, why do we do this? Why do we carbonate alcoholic beverages? Because alcohol is not absorbed very well from the stomach. It's absorbed quite slowly. It's absorbed very quickly from the small intestine. And what the carbon dioxide does is it relaxes the gate, the sphincter between the stomach and the small intestine, speeds transit time, okay? More gets absorbed faster. It's all about the curve, all right? There are now two states, pretty soon five, more after that, that say that it is your right, your right, to use marijuana recreationally. I'm not going to get into the wisdom of that debate. What I want to point out, though, is that the pot that is in the mind of most of these legislatures, legislators is, and voters is not the slobbery little joint that you and I passed around, right? These are extremely potent strains of marijuana with very, very, very high THC content, all right? It never stays where you think it's going to, all right? We always push the curve. And so, of course, what people are doing now is they're taking this THC, they're purifying it with butane oil and smoking it in the pipe. That is a very different drug. Same class, but it's almost a completely different drug in its risk, okay, because of the curve, right? Same thing with these e-cigarettes. When they first came out, there were these cute little things with the blue light. Isn't that sweet, right? <laughs> 
I don't know about you, but this is not what we see in our treatment center. We see these honking metal and glass lightsabers with this giant cartridge of nicotine. And again, it never stays where you think it's going to. People are unscrewing the thing, exposing the vaporization coil, pouring the concentrated nicotine right onto the coil, and giving themselves a far more powerful dose of nicotine. And so we're starting to see very young people come into treatment, and we can't even touch them with the patch and the gum. That's how profoundly dependent upon nicotine they are, right? It's all about the curve. Now, it's very easy for me to stand up here and be high-handed about smoking because I don't smoke. But I've got a problem that is just as bad and just as dangerous <laughs> with this stuff, all right? And I'm telling you, the, the problem is bad. It's gonna be touch and go tonight as to whether or not I'm gonna go to one of your fine 7-Elevens and get a giant Slurpee and a whole bunch of candy, all right? It is serious. It's as bad as any smoker. I got a lot of sympathy for my brothers and sisters in recovery who smoke. If, and I know it's bad for my recovery. I know it puts my sobriety at risk. And I know that if I don't get a handle on this, the drug that is most likely to kill this recovering addict is right here. This is what life is like with too few dopamine receptors. We always, you know, we almost always have something else to struggle with and, and the struggle goes on for a long time. And as long as the intoxication is in there, it's going to cause problems. It's going to continue to prime that pump. And so I'll leave you with this. I gotta kinda keep my eye on the clock. Um, we've talked about the, the most important things here. Um, there's a difference between fruit and Fruit Loops, all right? <laughs> Fruit is fruit. <laughs> Eat all the fruit you want. It's good for you. Have as much as you like. It's sweet. It smells good. It's colorful. There's something very different, all right? They are all that smell, all that color, all that sweetness extracted and packaged in a form that can be ingested within minutes, all right? Uh, that's the danger, right? So this is one of the, the, there are three things that we know cause relapse, okay? One of them is stress. One of them is exposure to drug cues. But the first one is any brief re-exposure to the drug, which makes sense if you are a crack smoker and you try to snort a little cocaine, don't be surprised if you relapse to crack. But it also begs the question, what is it that's causing the relapse? And it really seems to be, you know, what is the dopamine load of that individual? How much are they using dopamine releasing chemicals and behaviors to not for enjoyment purposes, but to cope with the stress of the day? And so a large part of the strategy of dealing with this part of addiction is to get a sense of that dopamine load and try to take out the spikes. And that can include nicotine or sugar secession. This is, a, I would say, a lifetime project, right? Uh, and then, and I think this is very important, is putting normal dopamine releasers back into the picture. These natural, competitive, alternative uh, rewarding activities that can compete with drug use and can start to stabilize the dopamine system a as best as it can. But it could be that that paucity of dopamine receptors was always there. For instance, childhood ADHD is a paucity of dopamine D2 receptors, right? And it, even when we get sober, there still may be a problem with those dopamine receptors and that, that's what recovery is, at least on a very basic level, is trying to cope with that. Well, I'm keeping my eye on the clock. Um, we did uh, several hundred, well, more than 100 slides, 143 slides. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions before we finish up? Uh, yes, ma'am. I was wondering if the D2 dopamine receptors that you lose because of alcohol, can they ever be recovered? Yes, but I think that, I think that we have to kind of see our, um, our, our hedonic system as a, as a finite quantity. There's only so much I've got at any one time. This is George Koob's idea that, you know, once you spend it, that's it. And I also have to kind of see it as something that I have to take care of, that I have to tend like a garden or, or repair occasionally like a roof. And so my relationship to pleasurable activities is very, very important. If I overuse things, if I go home and I binge eat candy, I'm damaging the system. But if I make an effort, a deliberate effort, to engage in healthy, normal, pleasurable activities, I can reverse that. So it really is like Paracelsus said, the dose makes the poison or the surge causes the damage. I gotta take that spike out and put these things back in. Does that make sense? 
And I mean, if you look at people, I mean, there are people who've used their body weight in drugs, right? But when they get sober and they work a program, they look like they're having a good time to me. You know, I go skiing with them and they seem to, you know, have just as good, good a time as anybody else's. So I think it's a, overall a very hopeful message. Uh, yes, sir? So based on that information, what's your thoughts on like, drug replacements like um, Suboxone? Right. Well, it's a controversial topic. I want to be, uh, here, let me just put this back on. Uh, so I put buprenorphine down here, okay, because it's important to state this. You know, this is an abusable drug. It can get people high. It has a very, very different profile from the things that, you know, people typically use like oxycodone or heroin, right? But it's still going to produce that risk. And what people have a tendency to do, especially opioid addicts, is then combine, put another drug on top of it, put Valium on top of it, put a 40 ounce malt liquor on top of it, and try and extract that even more. So I mean, to me, buprenorphine, we need every damn tool we can get. We are not, we do not have the luxury of looking at the table and saying, well, not this and not that. Because sometimes that's appropriate for the patient. Sometimes that's appropriate for, the, I need it all, right? Now I'm an AA guy, I got sober in AA, I got sober in a very, fairly conservative treatment program that was based on abstinence. I like that way of getting sober, I'm happy I got that sober that way. But I need methadone, and I need those other drugs for people who are much, much sicker than me. What I would say though, is that that is a step on the way to the high quality sobriety that I got. And if I say, well, we're just gonna put you on this for the rest of your life or that, yeah, there are studies that say that that's the best thing to do if you want to avoid things like death. But I've got problems with that because maybe I'm just being prejudiced. I'm saying that the quality recovery that I got is, 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 you know, is good enough for me, but it's not good enough for you. And I, I think that I really need to take a look at that. So I think that, uh, that you know, what, before we start talking about putting people on medications for life, let's really think about, wow, you know, can we really get, well, can we go for the brass ring here? Because I think we can, no. But I, I do need every single tool. Most of the, you know, when I ran my little recovery residence, we had six people out of 91 on buprenorphine at any one time. It was politically very explosive. In fact, I had a referent say, if you ever put one of our patients on buprenorphine again, or if you take them to a doctor that does, we'll never send you another patient. The problem is, is that they handed me a patient who was smoking two packs a day and relapsed immediately. They handed me an unstable patient, I stabilized them, right? So I didn't like that. <laughs> but the thing is, is that we weren't just giving the strips. We had them locked up. We counted every single one. I tested the staff for buprenorphine to make sure no hijinks was going on. They went to a meeting at least three times a week. They were in a safe living environment. So when we took care of all those other recovery management things, the risk of the buprenorphine went down. And so we're starting to, I, I know several pilots who, who fly planes that you and I fly on, and they developed an opioid problem, and they went to treatment, they stabilized buprenorphine for a period, and then they get off, got off, because they knew that they could never fly unless they were, you know. And so that was sort of a stage on the way. So it has its role, you know, how it should be used. I think the problem is we're using it this way, we're just handing it out. And we're not really good, doing good patient management, and so the risk is just through the roof. Long question to your very simple, long answer. Yes, ma'am. You, all areas. Right. Um, a lot of times they will get a lot of heroin, you know, um, and um, they, when they get into the treatment centers, they give them medicine. Right. You know, they give them, uh, no, not so much, but I mean, they'll, they'll hand out medications. I'm trying to think of the name. I'm yeah, sure. Seroquel. <laughs> Topiramate. <laughs> Trazodone. Yeah. <laughs> They're still foggy. You know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I, 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 I have seen addiction psychiatrists who understand recovery and who are 
They are willing to leave the pharmacology gun holstered <laughs> more than they pull it out. And I've seen them see patients through some very, very difficult times using judicious, careful, limited amounts of medications. So I don't want to, you know, just take the whole field of addiction psychiatry out of the picture. There are patients who could use that. But yeah, over-medication is a problem. And I can tell you at our treatment center, most of the time we're using trazodone, it's because the patient can't sleep. And we don't want to have them up at the nurse's station at three in the morning telling us terrible jokes, right? And so, you know, <laughs> Seroquel too. You know, we're more likely to want to try to calm down the behavior than necessarily deal with it. And I think that that's a problem. I think that we should look at that. And so, yeah, um, you know, I, I would definitely want to take most of the senior addiction psychiatrists that I know have become more and more conservative with their use of medications as they've gotten further and further in their careers. And I just need to keep that in mind. But again, there are some patients who will need something. Okay, uh, well, you know what? Uh, oh, yes, ma'am, one more question. It doesn't matter what I think, it's true. <laughs> and I, I mean, my opinion has nothing, no bearing on it. And I think this work is becoming more and more known and more and more solid. Certainly know, we know in community studies, the work by John Kelly shows that there are definite benefits in the outcome of patients if they are going to mutual support groups. My own feeling is that I need AA <laughs> to really get me to look at my own behavior. I don't think it's just going to meetings and palling around with a bunch of people. It really was that rather painful experience of going through, you know, the steps with a sponsor. So I worry about, you know, I certainly want the, 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 the I want uh, mutual support groups, recovery groups to proliferate. That sounds great. But I wonder if some of these are really as, if they have the firepower of you know, the 12-step programs. They certainly don't have the ubiquitous, they're not everywhere like 12-step programs are. And that, for me, is very, very important because I travel a lot, right? And so, you know, I, I, I definitely think, well, I'll tell you, so, and I'll stop after this. I was, uh, went to prison, and uh, the first 90 days of my sentence, I was in solitary confinement. And, uh, which is, we'll get into it another time, but, uh, eh. Fuck me up a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. I don't mean I don't mean to use language like that. I apologize. I, you know, I'm, I'm from Utah. We don't we don't do that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah, but it was definitely you know neurotoxic. The one thing that they would let me out for every thir Tuesday night at 7 p.m. was an NA meeting, and an H and I group came into the brig to do that meeting at Leavenworth they would not let an H&I group come in. And those AA meetings were absolutely indistinguishable. Or I didn't recognize anything about them being a 12-step meeting. I mean, very, very quickly they deteriorated into something that really isn't a 12-step meeting. But the H&I group at the Camp Pendleton Brink, they came, they did that meeting. And I would come back from that meeting absolutely euphoric. And, and see, this is the one good thing about solitary confinement is that it controls for confounding variables very nicely. <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, I see people, they can't stand meetings. They can't even stand five more meeting, minutes in a meeting. They see no hedonic value whatsoever in a meeting. I gotta tell you, I'm grateful for the experience of solitary confinement that it taught me meetings can be certainly hedonic even euphoric, and so yes, I, from my own personal experience, I can't point you to a study, but I could search for one, and I could send that to you if I find it, but from my own personal experience, yes, they were very, very important in restoring that hedonic tone in my brain. Okay, well, it's a little after nine. I'll be up here to answer questions. Thank you very much for your time.